and welcome to the NBS Show Discussion Podcast. I am your host, Norman Senzo. Joining me today is Silver Quill. I continue on my path towards world domination. I wasn't supposed to say that. Oh, oh no. Does that mean we all have to be trash dove? No, it just means that you'll all have to become Luna fans. <laughs> I'm already a Luna fan. This works for me. Kill me. Is that part of the contract, Silva? Well, if we if we have to k- kill the non-believers, then I've gone a step too far. Aww. I was ready. I had my pick shock and everything. And also joining us today is Seppi. I got the late night munchies. Nom. Gee, how are you doing? Nom. Oh, you hear that? She's nominal. Oh, gee. Yay. I'm starving. And I'm tired. But I don't care. Why don't you rest and eat then? Because, man, I see things. Oh, she's already delirious. This is going to be an interesting podcast. Seth, be like, the main six colors are talking to me. <laughs> uh. Okay, frick you, I am not chromastegic. Although I kind of wish I was. What's that? When you hear colors. <laughs> okay. So, anyway, on today's episode... We're doing a Patreon sponsored video or podcast. So uh, this is brought to you by Name Drogatorius. Thank you, dear good sir. Sorry for the delay on this one. To be honest, this is our second time recording this because uh, behind the scene, uh, kayfabing a little, we recorded something, then I accidentally deleted it. <laughs> and now we're here. So anyway, uh, you'll probably get something more of a structured podcast. But knowing us, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, but anywho, in today's um, episode discussion, we are going to discuss about uh, the main six character arc. Are they over or can they still move on and evolve? Just want to let you guys know that there will be spoilers in this episode. So... You have been warned. So before we hit into it, let's get a round table of first impressions that we do in the review show. So Silver, what do you think? Well, the thing about character arcs is that people often assume that when you complete an arc, your character is done. And I think this is a mistake. Arcs are just parts of a circle. Your character rises to a challenge, completes it, grows a little, but then is presented with another challenge. Much like real life, there is no end point other than, you know, we all got to shuffle off the stage at some point. But if you stop growing before then, are you really alive? And so the question for me is, what if the main six completed, but what does that open up for their futures? What's the next challenge? And that's can be hard because, as we saw from, uh, say, Twilight becoming an alicorn, change is not always well received. All right, all right. And Seppi? Even though an quote-unquote arc is over, you never stop growing. That's as simple as it gets for me. Although I wish that like um some characters had more established arcs that they need to get through, it's kind of fun to make up ideas for the ones that don't. Like Pinky. All right, and before you reveal set theories, as for me, I don't know if I would say that any character arc would be over. To say that the character arc is over would mean that the series is over. Um, a good example of that would be uh, the first Dragon Ball series. Uh, this is the kid Dragon Ball uh, where Tiny Goku fought uh, Lord Piccolo. In that story... He was just a monkey kid who flew on a cloud. And in the end, he defeated uh, Lord Piccolo and trained some more, um, technically, to become stronger. And by that point, if it ended there, like, okay, it's the end. But we continue on to the second arc of the story where Goku became a teen and had to fight more challenges in between. So to say that a character's arc would be over is not true, yet it depends on the circumstances. Goku's circumstances now being a guy who puts every universe at risk. Oh Oh my god. And my personal feeling for that is I just hate that Goku. I seriously hate the heck out of him. On the opposite spectrum, I love the new Vegeta. 
the proud papa. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Have you seen the newest episode? Yes. Oh my god, the way he just thinks of, no, the, the, just, oh man, I, I'm gushing over the new Vegeta, sorry. Uh, but anywho, uh, back to ponies. So let's start with the obvious. Uh, let's start with the first of, out of the two characters that have fully developed their, well, uh, initial arc. Um, I'm gonna go start with Rainbow Dash since she's the most obvious here. So Rainbow Dash, Pegasi, uh, Super Speedster, very popular marketing ploy for Hasbro. Uh, she wanted to be a Wonder Ball, and she is a Wonder Ball now. Her character arc started from just your average fangirl who wanted, who dreamt of being a Wonder Ball, and went through a lot of things till she became a Wonder Ball. So that is a perfect arc for her in terms of what she tried to achieve. She technically achieved her goal and now here she is, a full-fledged Wonderbolt. Now the question is, does she have more to offer or does she have more to aspire to? And Silver, what do you think? Well, her arc, I want to join the Wonderbolts, is clearly done because, well, it's kind of hard to keep an arc going after you've joined. But I, I enjoyed Newbie Dash for the idea that you've got your dream job and now suddenly it's not what you thought it was. It's it's not easy street. So many people think, oh, I've got my dream job. That's the end of the story. No, no, no. No, 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 no. No, no, no. Now it's a question of, one, getting to know these people who you work with, these folks who may not be uh, the people you envisioned. Misty fly. <laughs> but now Rainbow has a lot of choices before her. What kind of Wonderbolt does she want to be? How does she want the team to grow? And perhaps most important, what does she want to do when a newbie comes on after her? Sooner or later, there'll be a new Wonderbolt after her, and R- Rainbow will have a choice to make. Do I want to tease or give a nickname like was given to me, because that's quote-unquote the tradition, or... Am I going to want to be different? Am I going to want to be a different kind of Wonderbolt and part with tradition? Which is important that tradition is a part of identity, but it should not be a slavish devotion. With that in mind, after Newbie Dash aired, I did some research on military traditions. Have either of you heard of a thing called blood pinning? Honestly, if we're going by not really will be timey wimey stuff, uh, no. But since we're doing this a second time, yes. But I'm just going to say no for dramatic effect. For dramatic effect, it's nervous. you're beating yourself up too much over this man. Blood, blood pinning, why does that sound dirty? <laughs> well, it's certainly not pleasant. When a member of a group, platoon or a squad, get promoted, they'd receive a new insignia badge. And the tradition was that everyone would line up, walk in front of the newly promoted member, and give a good punch to their new rank. And the yes. punch would would eventually... Mm, penetrate the skin a little, maybe create a little scar, and it's the blood, blood pinning. Now, on its own, that sounds rather violent, but people would say, oh, that's just tradition. But then, oh my, look at this, you're bringing minorities into it, you're bringing folks who may have, you know, don't ask, don't tell. Mm -hmm. This practice was discontinued after some investigation, but it was the tradition for a time, and it wasn't always fair. You know, people would punch harder if you were on the outside. Now, I found one guy who did a testimonial, and he he said, I told my teammates, "I you punch me, I punch back. So his blood pinning was very light. And he said, I don't want to teach people that way. I'd rather lead by example than enforce that kind of cruelty. And I believe the military uh, followed that mentality in that they leaned down hard to stop that tradition. And honestly, it's a tradition I don't think was worth keeping. Talking about tradition, with the name calling or... Well, in Rainbow Dash's case, she got Rainbow Crash. To me, that could be a call sign. You know, some people have their unique um, nickname and whatnot. And well, for me and my circle of movie-going friends, um, I'm called... Pony guy? Pony boy? Something like that? Just because of my love for My Little Pony. Uh, that doesn't really affect me that much because, yeah, I like this show. If you ask why, then I'm going to explain it. It'll be 
a funny story, you know. It will be a funny conversation piece to have. But I do understand that name calling or nicknames like this can hurt. And in Rainbow Dash's case, she was affected by it. And that's not fun. Safi, what do you what did you think of uh, Newbie Dash's presentation of tradition, 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 tradition? Well, tradition. It's their way, it's their way. I mean, why? I I can see why like someone like outside wise would not be um, you know, as for it, especially with you know Dashie's background. I mean, kind of for instance princess of friendship elements of loyalty I know you shouldn't be defying the uh, main six by their elements but considering uh, Dash's background it can be a bit off-putting that you know they're kind of how do I put it I wish there was some context I mean but with the actual background of like oh this is what the military people do I, I can see what they're going with, but, you know, to an outside perspective, it's like, it's kind of dickish. Well, some traditions are confusing. Hence, the previous episode we did about uh, Friends Forever 31. Uh, why don't they just go to Celestia and ask to raise the sun a bit and whatnot? Like, there's certain things that are done which doesn't make sense, but it's tradition, if I'm getting my point across. Um... So I'm just going to sing that every time someone says it. <laughs> what, tradition? Tradition! Uh, tradition! But, but with Rainbow Dash, we're not really moving on to the point of, okay, this is what she is. She's done with her Wonderbolt thing. And like you mentioned before, Rainbow Dash could be a different kind of Wonderbolt leader. And talking about leaders... Why not Rainbow Dash just grabs the title of Captain of the Wonderballs soon after um, Spitfire or Sorin uh, gets promoted? So her next goal in the Wonderball thing could be Captain of the Wonderballs. Although now I'm just envisioning an evil world uh, equestria where everyone has a beard. (laughs) And so you die, Spitfire. We all move up in rank. (laughs) What? That's mean. Yeah. Well, that's that's how it would probably go there. Uh, I, I'm just imagining Spitfire with the beard all yellow and uh, reddish, and while Rainbow has her rainbow color beard. A rainbow beard, that'd be awesome. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, but still, um, next arc for Rainbow Dash could be her becoming captain or having her own team. That'll be interesting to have. A lot of people were kind of hoping at the end of Wonderbolt Academy this would be Rainbow breaking with the Wonderbolts, that she'd abandon an old dream and start a new one. It would be interesting if Rainbow went up against, decided to make her own team instead. The Shadow Bolts? However, at this state, well, actually at this point I'm wondering, we've got a few washed out Wonderbolts. I would like to see the Shadow Bolts become something more than just a distracting illusion. Maybe the next arc is try a competition or rivalry with the, with Shadow Bolts. Um, well, that'll be interesting, but unfortunately the Shadow Bolts were used, sorry, unfortunately the Shadow Bolts were recently used in the annual comics, so eh, I don't think that could be a possibility unless um, the writers were to spin it in a really interesting way. All we need is for Lightning Dust and uh, Wind Rider to gather a few malcontents and give them uniforms inspired by Nightmare Moon Shadow Bolts. There you go. Yeah. These good times. And this time they're not illusions. This time they're real. And they're better. This time it's for keeps <laughs> by Michael Bay. Oh, no. Explosions by Michael Bay. <laughs> Oh, no. Uh, Ruin Childhood Dreams by Michael B. But anywho, uh, is there anything else we're missing here? Well, yeah. what what about how Rainbow presents herself to her fans? I mean, she's always been able to bask in Scootaloo's adoration. But we've also seen that the attention and praise can go to her head, a la Mysterious Mare-Do-Well. 
for all the criticisms of that episode, I think they got Dash's ego down pretty well. Yeah, unfortunately so. So my question to everyone is, Would does Dash have to learn to accept praise with humility? Hmm, I'm, I'm still wondering about that because as for now, ever since she became a Wonderbolt, uh, there's no episode involving her dealing with fame. Um, as for now, we just see her dealing with daily life in Ponyville. And this is the part where maybe the town's folks of Ponyville are immune to her, um, status because, well, it's just Rainbow Dash. I know her. She's the weather pegasi for Ponyville. And we've got the news to it. But it will be interesting to see how that goes to another town. Probably like, uh, let's just say Clausdale. Maybe she's a big thing in Clausdale. And um, we have an episode where Rainbow Dash needs to deal with the fame. Uh, with, maybe Rainbow Dash needs to deal with the popularity and fame over there. And we have an episode where she decides to move to Cloudsdale. That would be sad. Everybody would be like, come back to Ponyville. <laughs> yeah, that'll be an interesting episode. But uh, I do remember that we might get an episode with um, Dash's parents. So maybe that will be the ego episode? Maybe. Also, you know, did we give a spoiler warning before we jumped into this? No. No, we did not. Norman! Oh, you know what? I'm going to do the time thing that I usually do. Like, you'll notice at the beginning of the episode and stuff. So anyway, um, continue on. Let's do the time warp again! Yeah! But, uh, quite possibly, but I'm not... I don't know who William Shatner is going to play. Everyone's sort of speculating... All I know is that all I, if that were the case, all I'd want is for him to look at Rainbow and go, there's some thing, some horrible thing on your, your wing there. Will you please just brush it off? <laughs> Seriously, Dash. Uh, but you, you know what? I, if, if, uh, William Shatner's playing Rainbow Dash's dad, I, I want him to do a good job where we don't know that's him. We can't tell that's his voice. Like, I want him to go all out to show us that he has range. Oh, I know he has range. He's Danny Crane. <laughs> like Mark Hamill. Mark Hamill has a lot of range. You you wouldn't know that he was the Joker or he was... I knew he was the Joker. Mark Hamill's the Joker? You I have never heard this. You don't say. But still, um, he, he did play a lot of other roles besides, well, um, Luke Skywalker and Joker from the Batman animated series and all of the Arkham games. I mean, the guy has range, and I would like to see Shatner pull this off, too. Miss Dash, did you know that friendship is magic? <laughs> I'm doing the worst possible impersonation. I fear the Trekkies will lynch me. Oh, uh, no. Uh. Eh, you're fine. Your voice is smooth enough. You should be fine. <laughs> oh, I, pre I appreciate that. Well, th there's a theory there, and let's move on to the next pony on the list, unless um, anybody wants to add anything before we move on. Yep. Seppi? Nah. -uh. Alrighty then. Next pony on the list is Rarity. So Rarity is the unicorn fashionista of the group. She's from Ponyville and always dreamt of owning a store in Cantalot. And funny enough, she already did. And, well... It was an interesting episode to have because uh, that episode that we had was called uh, Rarity Takes Manhattan, was it? Sorry, no. Um, a Cantalot Boutique. Yes, uh, Cantalot Boutique. And that was in Season 5, right? Yes. Yes, uh, Cantalot Boutique, yes. So that episode came out rather interesting where... We don't get to see the setup of her struggling to get the store. What I mean by this is there's certain stories that you can take with um, this scenario where you get to see the hard work, the time spent just getting the store. In any episode, this would be her triumph in uh, having the store. But what the show does is instead of showing her triumph of getting the store, it just starts out 
with her getting the store and it shows us the struggle of maintaining the store. And I really like that scenario that they did because it takes a twist out of the norm. Well, this one always caused a bit of stir because basically everyone was so upset at uh, Sasuke Saddles. And again, it's it's a lot like Rainbow and Newbie Dash. Is you get your dream job, but then you have to realize what you're facing, what you may have to give up, or that what you may have to consider. And for a little bit there, it looked like Rarity was going to uh, give up on her dream. Which, man, again, that would have been interesting. Uh, that's not to say that it's she's uninteresting, but now it is sort of a question of what next. Rarity has her boutique. She's reaffirmed what she loves about it. So where do you go from here? You can We can have her get a new store every season. Yeah. Uh, Rarity for you in Manhattan. I'm sure next she'll have a fashion place in Las Pegasus. Uh, maybe she'll go for Applewood. But that would get incredibly old very fast. Yeah, yeah true. But mm-hmm. talking about new stores... She did open up a new store in Manhattan. And in that episode, we get to see her travel from one place to another to find a location to open up her store, which was really interesting. And we got to this um, episode where she got a review for the store. And that was in Maine in Manhattan, right? Sorry, no, no, no. Um, uh, That was in season four. Six. Cell Row Review. Yeah, the Cell Row Review. That was in Season 6. And you know what, Silver? I can see your point of, oh, every season, everybody opens up a new store. Yeah, that would become a, a terrible drain on her character. I think it's more interesting from this point, the arc of, oh, I need to become a successful business. We've seen her work harder than any other member of the main six to gain clientele, to build a name for herself, to build a reputation. But now she's got that, and I think it's time for her to take the next step and become a mentor. True. Maybe if she were asked to judge a fashion show, how would she make the decision? Would she go for what's safe, what's new? What's Would she be tempted to vote for who she likes over uh, a new talent? That would be interesting, and I can see that happening. Other than that theory, uh, probably... If we're talking about Rarity's um, character arc moving on, the mentor role would work for her because she is successful and knowledgeable enough. Or she could go for the uh, rivalry as um, angle where another fashionista is coming to town and she's as good or even better than her. Now Rarity needs to get good. Oh, they gotta pull a Dark Souls and get good? Yes. <laughs> that's, that's what all the cool kids are saying nowadays, right? Indeed. Praise the sun. Praise the sun. Get good. <laughs> I'm hip and cool with it, yo. <laughs> uh, but you, you ain't cool until you smoke and joint. Oh, no. We don't do that. Don't actually do that at home, kids. That's bad. Indeed. But silver. Drugs are bad. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but silver, Seppi, what do you think of uh, said theory? Any validation? Any um, weight to it? Well, rivals are a hard thing. I mean, if you beat them in the first, if you beat them in one episode, how many times can you beat them before they lose uh, any credibility? Hmm. Mm. And well, in My Little Pony, it's hard to pull off a win for the quote unquote villain. And having Rarity lose? Well, no, she did lose. Um, remember in, well, almost lost, that is, in, uh, Made in, uh, Manhattan. Oh, Rarity takes Manhattan? Yeah, sorry, that one. Rarity takes Manhattan. Mm-hmm. She almost lost, but she didn't. I mean, she still came out with the win, and... Uh, oh, what was her name? Uh, Suripom- Suripomel? Sorry, um, Suripomelo? Suripolomer. Oh, sorry. Uh, Suri was defeated, but not humiliated. But the thing is, um, the only reason why we say that Rarity should win because Suri cheated. Now, imagine a scenario where her rival didn't cheat. She's just a obnoxious character, but she's good, and she didn't cheat. And if she won fair and square, 
that would inspire Rarity to get good. Well, perhaps she needs another... Or what if she had to compete against Coco Pamel in a contest? That would go well because, uh, well, <laughs> that'll be interesting because the thing is, um, Coco is working for Rarity in her Manhattan division. And <laughs> if she defeats Rarity, probably she'll be out of a job. But I don't think Rarity is that vindictive. Oh no, I don't expect Rarity would turn on her, but, I'm still I'm still drawn to the idea that Rarity now gets to guide the fashion industry. I'd like to see her take a stand for a clothing should not obscure a character, they, a person. They should enhance them. The difference between you look good in this dress versus it looks good on you. And you know what? Yeah, I can see that happening with some of the characters that might come out for Rarity. Uh, it'll be interesting to see. And I can see this kind of episode happening for her so maybe she'll lead the industry by example with what she stands for uh, making the pony look good instead of uh, making the dress look good Seppi? I I think she well bleh Rarity has been a sign for me of like you know as an artist she could be going through like some struggles that most artists do like, you know, we've already established, like, with her uh, business side and creative side and whatnot in um, Canrawat Boutique. But what if she had a problem regarding her own style going out of style? Hmm, that would be interesting. Like, business is going down for her and it's, like, stressing to find ways to bring it back up, trying to come up with new... Styles and designs, but nothing's working because she's so frustrated. And this would mean for her to evolve and have an arc where... She, it's, hard, it's hard to say because uh, said episode idea that you mentioned, oh, sorry, that you propose, involves her, well, changing her style. And I, I don't know if that could be an arc. That could just be an episode. Silver? It could be an episode, but hey, it's a good episode idea in order to develop thing. Mm-hmm. All right. And Silver, what do you think? Well, it's a challenge because what would Rarity learn from this? The, abil- the ability to be open-minded, that to not fear the new? That'd be a good message. True. Mm-hmm. And I do remember in the uh, <clears throat> Ponies of Dark World arc, a line that uh, Princess Luna said that um, fashion is a cycle. Uh, fashion never goes out of style. Something like that, if I remember. Yes, indeed. So maybe Rarity could take this to heart where, um, okay, her style's, um, considered to be out of fashion. So to buck the trend, she tries something daring, tries something extreme, which is going old school. That could work. Very true. Very true. But it's all sort of nebulous. It's, it's because right now Rarity's just simply building her her empire. <laughs> oh, maybe that's it. Maybe her next fashion will be as Celestia is my witness. Celestia will wear one of my dresses. Celestia standing just to the left. Um, okay, <laughs> I don't mind <laughs> as long as free. And well, I think there's it's for Rarity. Um, in uh, to summarize, Rarity could become the mentor, or Rarity could get a new rival. So yay. Um, let's move on to the next pony. And next pony, I believe we should talk about Applejack. Applejack is another business pony. Um, she is a earth pony from Ponyville and she is one of the hardest working ponies out of the main six. A second to rarity, of course. And well, she starts off her business at a at a very young age where she needs to gain money to fix the farm. That seems to be one of the themes for season one and season one to three. Money solves everything. True that. <laughs> and now um, I, I don't know if the farm needs the money or not, because every time I take a look, see, she's pretty well off. And she's not even the owner of Sweet Apple Acres. Granny is. True. She's just the manager. Granny's the owner. But besides um, whoever owns the farm, it is still a family business. So technically she does own the farm too, to a degree. So now Applejack here, 
uh, she's always been shown to be a family pony where she takes care of the farm, the family, and her friends. And she does what's right for all of the above. And her character arc, I don't know where to start off because besides the initial introduction of her wanting to try something new but ended up going to uh, Ponyville to take care of the farm, I don't see where she starts off and where she can end. I'm going to follow up on an idea uh, proposed in Friends Forever where Applejack works with Mayor Mayor for the day. Applejack has always been devoted to Ponyville overall. She is very much the heart of Ponyville. Pinkie Pie is the laughter, but Applejack the heart. We saw this at the Super Ciders, hmm, how do you say it? Super Speedy Cider Squeezy 6000. Mm -hmm. Uh, Everyone was heartbroken when they thought that Applejack might have lost her farm or her family's farm. And I think Applejack has a very strong sense of community. That's why I don't think she'll ever really go outside of Ponyville. But what if, at one point, Mayor Mayor steps down and Applejack decides the best thing for the town is not for her to run Sweet Apple Acres, but for her to run for mayor? And she could have perhaps a short-lived rivalry with another opponent. Given the uh, election election, uh, piece in the comics... Filthy Rich should not run against her. Yeah. That'd be rehashing. But maybe a new rival, a new challenger has appeared. And have Applejack sort of test her mettle of how she wants to run Ponyville. What can she do to help improve it? Hmm, true. And there's also an angle where if Mayor Mayor steps down, uh, people propose, why not just Princess Twilight Sparkle take over the... Um, duties of uh, what you call this government, uh, but a princess is supposed to be responsible for the land, not the town. That'd be an interesting step. So Twilight tries to take on the duties, but realizes she's getting overwhelmed. And Applejack says, "To help my friend, I will run for mayor." Well, I that could work. Or um, <clears throat> an idea is uh, my mayor steps down and gives full responsibility to Twilight. Twilight says, "Yay, I accept," but. It's she's in over her head, and in between, Applejack steps in and helps wherever she can. And Twilight, seeing this, proposed the idea to Applejack, where you know what, since you're doing a really good job, I believe that you should take over duties to take care of Ponyville. And hence, here Applejack becomes the mayor of Ponyville. The only problem with that is that it that skirts circumvents an election, which. It's kind of important. I, I feel like a mayor should be elected. True. And well I know Pony I know Equestria is more of a, a matriarchy, but uh I on the mayor level I think you can still be elected. True. And why not this? Why not we introduce a new character for uh this scenario where we have two ponies helping Twilight? Uh, we have Applejack for one, and a new unknown pony, or probably a known pony, for the situation. And Twilight is in a dilemma where, okay, you guys are both good, and I'm way over my head. So you know what? Let's hold an election. The town folk will pick who is the better um, candidate. That could work. I see Amethyst Star doing this, the one who was the best organizer next to Twilight. <laughs> Yeah, even though her winter wrap ups never never finished on time. <laughs> mm-hmm. See, there's some there's something to uh, rehash again. So this could be a possible uh, storyline to go with. And yeah, having Applejack becoming a mayor, I do agree with that one. Um, Seppi, do you have any other ideas for Applejack here? For Applejack? Nah, not really. Applejack, but his background pony. Oh, so nah, mean. I'm kidding. But like I mentioned before. Applejack here is the well-balanced one of the group. Theoretically. True. And by that, I mean she has the least problem out of the main six. The only problem when she is shown on show is having money problems, having trust issues, having a deep paranoia for fruit bats. But besides that, she's rather stable. Well-grounded, I would say. 
but that also makes her harder to write for. True that. And the episodes that have come for her in the previous episodes have been always, let's just say, out of character for her. Like they push her boundaries of what's believable. Although there's one other, there's one other uh, idea that comes to mind. What if Big Macintosh decided to move away from Sweet Apple Acres to live life on his own for a time? How would Applejack handle that? Hmm. Her older brother wants to get a little bit of his own identity. That'd be interesting. You know what? That could be interesting. And by this point, Applejack has to hire more ponies to uh, alleviate some of the workload that Big Mac has to take care of. And we have the whole dynamic of Applejack trusting new ponies into the farm. You know what? That could work. Very possible. True, true. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else to add to Applejack? Nah. Alrighty then. So to summarize, Applejack's character development for the next arc could be A, she becomes mayor of Ponyville and B, she starts trusting ponies outside of her circle of friends. That could work. And trusting, let's see, mm, I believe we should go for Fluttershy. Ooh. Now there's a challenge. We don't even know what she does for a day job. True that. Takes care and marriage? I don't know. Uh, but to summarize who Fluttershy is, she is a Pegasi from Cloudsdale, moved to Ponyville to be more grounded to the earth and to take care of the critters in the Ponyville area. And well, as for what she does for a day job, it's unknown, but some fans have theorized that she might work for the equestrian wildlife thingy, probably. Who knows? That's one theory. The Equestrian Society for the Preservation of Rare Creatures? Yes, that. She could be working for them. So, yeah. But the thing about Fluttershy is that her journey so far, her arc, has been more about learning to be assertive and stand out. The Fluttershy Season 1 probably wouldn't have handled being able to organize the breezies or basically just show any amount of courage. She's Though she'll never be a big fan of crowds, she's learned to be more flexible. True. Well, probably not the preservation. Or maybe she could be a part-time veterinarian. So that could still work for her love of animals. Well, this is um, in theory, of course. But in terms of her development, I don't think Fluttershy has gone through all of her arc. Like you mentioned before, Silver, from season one, she is the shyest pony out of them all. And she works her way up to become less shy, more open to being in the eye of the public. But what would she do with this public? Pony Traconicus relations? Well, she has tamed the beast, as they say. And out of, oh my. And out of all of the... Uh, main six, Fluttershy has been the only one to quote unquote team the beast. Because think about it, even Princess Celestia and Luna, well, I'm not going to count Luna, um, Princess Celestia and the rest couldn't make Discord do what they want. Yet Fluttershy here has told Discord and Discord listens to her. So that is a pretty interesting development for her. Discord will always claim he's doing his own thing, but basically, yeah, Fluttershy's got him played. Yep, we know who wears the pants in that relationship. Or better yet, Fluttershy is now the most powerful pony in Equestria. <laughs> oh, wow. God. You do not want to mess with her then. She just start going, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wow. Nope, 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 nope. Uh, so, anywho, on, in terms of Fluttershy's development, so, in season one, she was the shyest pony, and in season two, uh, she got used to crowds. Was it? If I remember right, there was Hurricane Fluttershy. Well, she learned to. She learned that even small contributions are important. And that was in season two, right? Or was that in season three? No, season two. Season two. Uh, what was I supposed to was that? Because I'm trying to double check here and I can't find it. Oh yeah, um, episode twenty two. All righty then. Well, as time goes on, she became more assertive, more hands-on, more brave, if you would agree. 
Fluttershy is a hard one to pick down. My favorite character, and yet it, it's hard to know where she'll go from here. Of all the characters who need sort of a more tangible goal, I think she might be one. Hmm. True, true. Um, I'm seeing here that, well, in season three, she tamed the Draconicus. In season four, um, she accepted that uh, being in the limelight is okay, but it's not for her. Season five, she kind of partook in something that scared her, but she, it's not for her kind of deal. And season six, I got no idea what she, no, in season six, she bullied her brother, yeah. Uh, and other than that, uh, we have to wait until season seven. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see how she evolves because from the looks of it, she's slowly being better at, at being shy or being more outgoing. Yes. Thank you. Um, being more outgoing, but I'm going to turn the st- uh, wheel a bit and say, why do you think of the human version? Like, does she have the same problems or is, is she a totally different character? Well, she definitely doesn't have to face the fear of monsters. Now she has the ability to talk to animals, which I find kind of funny. Her grand magical power is flutter is pony flutter shy on a normal day. True. Uh, but I'm going to throw out there that that flutter shy is more active in animal care centers. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, so seeing her become a veterinarian makes a lot of sense. Mm, all right. With Ponyville, they technically already have a veterinarian, which has always confused me somewhat. It's like, you think Fluttershy would want to work with her closely? Probably. I, I don't know. Um, to me, the way I look at Fluttershy is that she is a specialist. Uh, she tends to the unusual and wild. Like, could you just imagine having Harry at the vet? Like, that will spook some ponies. Like having a big brown bear there, like, hmm, ain't normal, yo. Oh, come on, one one bear hug and everyone would be fine. Yeah, but... You... Of, course, that, of course, then I think of Homer Simpson getting a bear hug, and they're highly overrated. <laughs> yeah. But still, um, that's one way to look at Fluttershy. Uh, Seppi, anything to add, too? Fluttershy? Mm-hmm. Nah, I think you guys got it covered. So, to summarize, Fluttershy's arc here may not be even over, but what we'd like to see is she um, evolve from what she already has here because she has started to shed her shyness a bit. And now I would like to see her, well, become a social butterfly, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. And conquer all of Equestria with her Draconicus and animal army. <laughs> it almost happened. Could you just imagine in the Ponies of Darkwater if she just called upon Discord? He probably would have found it fascinating. I know. <laughs> and, well, let's head to the hardest pony to decipher, Pinkie Pie. Or the Pinkie Pie. Yep, and Pinkie Pie is a hard one. Uh, Pinkie Pie is a pony from the rock farm living with her family. Until the sonic rainbow comes, she discovered the joy of laughter. From that point on, she moved to Ponyville, lived with the cakes, and started to spy on people. <laughs> okay, not really spy on people, but get to know them and uh, make them happy. She is a pony that wants to make other ponies happy, so that's good. So... How do we break her down? Oh, wow. If you want to break her down, you just have people ignore her. She gets all depressed. But really, Norman, why would you do that? I didn't mean it. I'm completely deflated. Norman, you're sick. I didn't mean it. You're sick. You're sick. You're sick. I didn't mean it that way. What I meant was... You're sick. You're sick. What I meant was for uh, character breakdown. Because from Rainbow Dash to Fluttershy, we get a general sense of who they are. But with Pinkie Pie, I think she's a bit difficult to decipher. How do you even start characterizing her? When we first saw her, she's basically the bubble-headed pony in the group. Like, she's one of your standard airheads in any show with this kind of premise. But we were wrong. She had more to offer. Indeed. She basically just views the world in a different way. A lot of people just dismiss her as stupid, but she's actually very smart, just slightly different mm-hmm. view, which is sometimes indecipherable. 
But with her, where do we even start? Should we start from the very top of where how she acts, or should we go in terms of what she does? Because I don't know where to start with Pinky. Well, one thing I very much like to know is how did she go from a rock farm to Ponyville? What drew her to that town? Hmm. We've never really known why she made the choice to move to Ponyville. Was it closest? Was did she know someone there? Well, um, a bit of spoilers ahead. Um, in season seven, there's going to be an episode entitled "Rock Solid Friendship," and in this episode, when Pinkie Pie learns that Mott might move to Ponyville, she does every think she can to make sure her sister sees that it has more to offer than just rocks. So this could be an episode where we get to see what attracted her to Ponyville. This could be the episode where we learn why she went there. Or probably not. Maybe not. But it's more a question of where does she go from here. Ponyville is a super happy place and and Pinky is very much in her element. No pun intended. <laughs> Oh, not to that I always intend mm-hmm. to pun. Silver, you're she's so th- funny. Thank you. I'm a mm-hmm. pundit. But she's also becoming aware of world of worlds where there aren't any, uh, there isn't as much parties. Dragons don't have as many celebrations. Yaks are a hard group. Perhaps Pinky's next goal is to become a party ambassador to the rest of the world. Outside of Ponyville, dumb. Probably. I don't know. Um, when it comes to Pinky and what she can do, the best assumption would be for her to be the ambassador of joy, to spread laughter throughout the whole nation. So, would you say that she could be the character where, hmm, I think I want to spread joy and laughter. And her first target would be Griffinstone. Oh, yeah. Well, first she's got a campaign to repeal that law. No singing, no parties! Wow, that was just rather strict. Like, mm, no public outburst of song. The, if, you, he, if, if you ever wanted to know how to make a pony cry. <laughs> well, she did stood her ground in Grivenstone, and I did like that joke that uh, she uh, Gilda told, which is, um, oh, what did you want to add? Friendship? Uh, Pinky said no. Um, baking soda. Uh, baking soda. <laughs> uh, that was rather cool. Very. Mm-hmm. But uh, let's see. So, Silva, you said that she could be the ambassador to spread joy and laughter, right? Yes. I don't know. I, I find Pinkie Pie hard to decipher in terms of what she can and cannot do. Um, I, I don't know. I mean. I would to say that she's a one trick pony is rather not true because she is able to do more. But when we sit down and think about it, it's hard to say what those things are. Because right now when we are doing this, I got no idea what pinky stick is besides to make other people happy and party. Seppi, you got anything? Last time when we tried doing this it was pretty much difficult to um you know, establish Pinky's character. It, it would be nice to see her go back to Griffinstone and, yeah, try to appeal that <laughs> law. The, gr- the great know. party sit-in of 18 Dickity 2. <laughs> well, still, um, anything? Because I-, I got nothing to add. No, I think even the last time, like, even before, like, uh, even after this recording, we couldn't figure out anything for Pinky. Seppi, why did you put all the Vanguard card? Because... Oh, because I found a hippogriff and I, I want to see Sulphur just as a gesture. <laughs> oh, surely you jester. Oh, you. Indeed, I doodle. Ah, excellent. Oh, you guys. But Doodle Dapple's a separate reviewer. <laughs> She's also in Europe, the last I checked. Ah. I saw her with a kinder egg, so I think she's in Europe somewhere. <laughs> well, uh, maybe she could be in Canada. Kinder eggs are legal there. Maybe. But, but anyway. Anyways. Yes, but anyway. Uh, in all honesty, I got no idea what to say about Pinky. Here's another question. Since we, we talk about Applejack and company uh, running the farm, mm-hmm. 
would Pinky ever have to be called back to the rock farm? Um, I doubt it because the way that the rock farm is, I think uh, her family members like Limestone and Marble would be a perfect fit to take care of the farm. Especially, um, who was the intense one that's really crazy? Marble, was it? Limestone. Limestone, yes. I think she's more suited. Although I can think of one, I can think of one thing that would be interesting. When Granny Smith asked Pinky's parents how they met, they mentioned the the matching stone, and that basically that made the choice for them. Well, what happens if Pinky is suddenly revealed? Hey, you have a fian- fiance. <laughs> the the matching stone has spoken. Oh, by the way, I have a fiance. What? <laughs> And now, and now, Pinky has to doesn't want to get married, not right now, especially if he's boring as can be. Uh, A little tension between her and her family. Probably, you know what? That uh, we didn't mention this in the previous recording, but you know what? This is a really good concept to have. Probably won't happen, but still, it's really interesting. One, I just want to know what this matching stone is. I have a vision of two heart shaped stones linked by a bola, and you just uh you just throw it and whoever gets clocked, <laughs> there's the couple. I have a very violent imagination. Linked by what? A bola. Okay. I I was thinking you said something else, even though it hardly yeah. made sense. Yes, I know. You probably thought Ebola. Exactly. Yes. It's like why would they be linked? To a disease that can kill them. Because, uh, believe me, I've, w- I've watched enough Neebs gaming in this joke to know. <laughs> uh, you're talking about that stone thingy with the ropes, right? Yes, a bola is usually two stones or a similar heavy objects linked by a rope. You throw it, it wraps around and usually clocks its victim either in the head or binds their legs. Yeah, yeah it's that one, yeah. So, yeah. But anywho, yeah, I do like that um, idea. Not going to happen, but still, I love it. Oh, why, why do you think it's not going to happen? Why? Why, 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 why? Have you ever seen the main stick have a story arc where they're in love? Yes, rarely. Well, Several times. <laughs> it did not end well for true. her. But We saw Twilight and Flash make googly eyes, but uh, that's gone nowhere. A betrothal that Pinky doesn't want. Now there's, there's a story, I think. Hmm. You know what? I, I was wrong because you prove, you proven me wrong with Rarity. And you know what? I don't mind seeing something like that then because it's, hmm, how do I put this? It's something interesting to see. And having Pinky Pie out of the other ponies being the one that says nope, 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 nope to something like this would be interesting. Unless they cook her up with cheese sandwich. Gasp. Or better yet, she tries to, she tries to fake that she's already married to Big Macintosh. No, 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 no. (laughs) They're cousins. Well, quote unquote cousins. But they're like 575th removed. Yeah, which is kind of, that still confused me. Are they, are they not? (laughs) It's always left vague, but the, the truth is with Big Mac and making eyes at marble, uh, they're far enough apart genetically that I, th- I think the children won't have like six hooves or whatever. <laughs> all righty then, all righty then. So to summarize, all righty then. Uh, to summarize, uh, Pinky's thing is she could be the ambassador or spreading laughter to out the nation of Equestria, or she could be uh, betrothed because of the. Pairing stone, or was it matching stone? Uh, I have to look. I have to look it up. I don't know if it was the matching stone. Uh, sh- all I know is you have a rock. Hmm, we're back to the rocks defining destiny. <laughs> a rock? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So it could be that. Uh, and last on the list is Princess Twilight Sparkle. Ah, so Princess Twilight Sparkle, what can we say? To summarize, she was a unicorn from Cantalot, moved to Ponyville because uh, by decree of Celestia, she has to make friends, and after doing so, she became the hero of the land where she defeated and retrieved Princess Luna from Nightmare Moon. Her story, or her character arc, was 
all done in three seasons. She started off as an introvert where she does not know what friendship is through the end where she became the princess of friendship and become a well-rounded extrovert. I don't know if I'd call her an extrovert. I think she's got, I think ambivert. She had, she's gotten so much better at crowds, but she still has some elements of her introvert itself needing to sit down and read a book. Ah, all right. Or just stay indoors and feel rejuvenated as she, you know, like, what was it? In sorts, the... her, sorts her library for three <laughs> days. Yeah, very much. Uh... Although I still want to call Bologna that. Three days in isolation, and yet she's worried about uh, Moondancer. Twilight, can we have a talk? I smell hypocrite. Priorities, Twilight, priorities. Well, either way. True, true. Uh, but still, uh, what can we say about Twilight? So let's start off with the obvious, where she has wings now. Le what? Uh, here's the thing that's always bugged me. I, I don't agree that the series is always building towards this. I feel like this was sort of an arbitrary decision. And folks are, we're sort of, we're tempted to retroactively think, oh, this was always leading to Twilight becoming an alicorn princess. Well. She could have been any number of things. I feel like, I still feel like this was a, more a marketing decision than anything. True, probably. But when it comes to the original uh, idea of uh, Twilight, uh, Lauren Faust stated that she wanted Twilight to, well, kind of take Princess Celestia's role over, if I'm right. But she also said there was no mention of eloquence yeah. in all this. So that's one of the things. And uh, yeah, having um, Twilight become an eloquent could be sales tactics. But from what I do remember with my talk with Larson, yeah, he mentioned that the original script that he wrote for the episode was not the same as what was shown on TV. Because when he wrote the script, it was a perfect package of, okay, things are done because Hasbro only contracted us for um, a syndicated episode, which was 65 episodes. But suddenly Hasbro wanted more. And if I do remember right from what he told me was uh, Megan McCarthy had to rewrite some of the script to fudge around to make it possible for a future season. So the finished product of what we are given it's not the envisioned product of what was envisioned. Wow, well, okay. Basically, they made a change and now they're just, uh, they're kind of listless. Kind of. And so we know from the spoilers of season seven that Twilight's going to fa- face some hard choices. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But what does she do afterwards? She hasn't really had to tackle being a princess head on in an episode. It's always been sort of in the background and we see the after effects, sleep deprived or wanting to set up an event, but then it becomes Pinky's episode. (laughs) True. Let's go for the initial first because Twilight's character development here from a pony that doesn't really know what's going on to the expert of friendship and from that point on became a princess of friendship and moved on to learn all about her responsibilities as a princess. Well, if you could call it responsibility. And now that she reached season 7, I think she passed two story arcs for her character. Like, the first is learning about friendship. The second is about becoming uh, the princess of friendship and what does it take to be one. And the third, which is going to be season 7, is how does she move on because from the quick 30 second trailer that was on um, the My Little Pony Facebook page she has to tackle the difficult choice of doing what Celestia did which was letting uh, Starlight go and do her own thing I don't know if that's the right choice because each student deals with certain situations differently and I don't know like we're not 100% sure of how things are supposed to be done yet well, I'm not even sure Twilight has grown to be grown into a role as princess. It just sort of happened. She became the princess of friendship because a magic box gave her a castle. I find it kind of funny that Twilight says, oh, this is what I choose. Choose, Twilight. I think the choice has been laid out for you pretty clearly yeah, already. Yeah. It's like, oh, I have wings. Okay. I live in the library. Nope. We give you a giant crystal tree. 
Okay, so, well, library's broken. You know what? I'll live in this free house. I don't need to pay rent. Yay. Here's the funny thing. Destiny is such a double-edged sword in storytelling. I think it was a mistake to have Twilight be told her role by Destiny rather than let her wrestle with it. Yeah, true, true. But moving forward, she's now in a position where she can help build friendships with other nations, but that requires diplomacy, requires effort. And I fear that because we've made the princess such a marketable uh, identity, Disney in particular, we're actually afraid to show a princess doing hard work because that's less marketable. True, but I don't know. I mean, the way that um, Disney is trying to buck the trend with that is, well, admirable with uh, stories like Frozen, Brave... Was it, was it Brave or Braid? I forgot. Uh, Brave. Yeah, Brave and Moana. Um, they're slowly changing their but, stance on the whole princess thing. Well, here's the thing, though. I agree, though, those characters are so much more dynamic and interesting than their Cinderella, uh, Cinderella Sleeping Beauty counterparts. But, and this is crucial, after the movie, what happened to uh, the princess from Brave? What happened to Merida in the Disney Princess line? They edited her to heck. Yes, true that. But um, yeah, I, I see what you mean by that because that was a marketing ploy that made everyone angry. And did they ever change it? No. No, they they kept it. And as far as I know, Moana and perhaps Elsa and not Elsa. Anna. Kind of, kind of mean. Uh, as far as I know, they'll get the Disney princess treatment as well. So even you, even though you have these very strong role models, they are reduced to make them marketable. Hmm. Yeah. Well, th that's not fun. Um, on a side note, do you remember Tangled? I never saw Tangled. Ah, um, Tangled is a 3D Disney movie about Rapunzel. Yes. Yeah. And well, uh, recently this year, Disney made a series of Tangled. Well, it's called Tangled the Series. Mm, nice naming convention. But in this story, they kind of tell what happened after she got free. Um, Finn, the um, scallywag, lives with the princess in the castle. And the cool dynamic of father, mother, and boyfriend living in the same roof. And, well... It's a really interesting story from what I've seen, and I don't mind watching more of it to see what happens. And in that one, Rapunzel has a hard time adjusting to the whole I'm a princess kind of thing. Like, I still walk around barefooted. So, if you guys do enjoy Tangle, I do recommend you guys go watching um, the series out of morbid curiosity if you want. But back to ponies... Yes, back to ponies. The pr yeah. the princess role is always uh, somewhat nebulous. I'm still waiting. Even my hopes for a Celestia episode have been diminished. But Safi, how, we we've been leaving you out of this conversation. What are your views on Twilight? Where can she go from here? Oh boy, Twilight! I honestly don't know where Twilight could go from where she stands. Um, maybe I just don't look into it that way. It's, it's okay, it's okay. Um, Maybe well, in a way she could, like, learn some more calming habits from Celestia? Maybe? Probably. Well, um, spoilers ahead. Uh, we do know that uh, there's an episode entitled A Flurry of Emotions. And in this one, after planning a jam-packed day, Twilight Sparkle also agrees to babysit her niece, Flurry Heart, but with Flurry Heart Long for the ride, Twilight Sparkle struggles to maintain her title as best aunt ever while keeping Flurry Heart out of trouble. So at least we get to see a new character development for Twilight where she needs to balance things out from being the best aunt ever to keeping Flurry Heart out of trouble. So we get to see some growth in her. Quite possibly. I'd be interested if Twilight took her magic studies to the next level. Equestria's got all these magical doodads and what's-its lying about. 
uh, the Alicorn Amulet, uh, the nine works of, eh, I forget the dude's name, but Starlight claimed he made the Staff of Sameness. What if Twilight started experimenting with creating magical items of her own to aid with friendship? And wh- what is the trial and error involved in that? That would be interesting to see. In fact, that be, what would be fun is if she kept trying and failing throughout the season, and by season finale, she finally creates the item that is used to defeat the villain. True. And, well, it seems that uh, Star Soul the Bearded here was a powerful unicorn in his days to almost to the effect of Twilight. The only difference between Twilight and Star Soul here is that Twilight found that friends while uh, Star Swirl here became a hermit. I'm not sure Star Swirl is gone. That'd be, that'd be another thing. If Star Swirl comes back, Twilight's gonna have so much, so many questions. True. Star Swirl here, from what I've seen in the comics, is a, well, from Katie Cook's point of view, is a rather absent-minded pony who kind of easygoing. Yeah. Yeah, well, you never know. There's been there have been multiple pr- presentations of him within the comic. Some he's very stern. Some he's very laissez-faire. Mm-hmm. Laissez-faire. Laissez-faire. Mm-hmm. Eclair. Oh, oh, oh. I am something incredibly inappropriate. Oh, <laughs> no. Uh, but in all honesty, to see stars will come back. That'll be interesting. And it goes back to your theory when you mentioned about ponies in Equestria don't pass. They just grow stupidly old. Sure seems that way. Yeah. Turns out that funeral from uh, from Hearts and Hooves Day, the song, uh-huh. that, that was just for a goldfish. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, so, in summarization... Twilight Sparkle here probably would be... I don't know. What do we say about her? Like, move on to become a teacher mentor? I don't know. I think her next phase is the pursuit of magical development. Ah, uh, yes. to, to really test the bounds of what can be created. To stop relying on ancient magic to save them and start making her own. Uh, as a princess... I personally put forth that the the archetype of the princess that is to grow and learn is held back by the marketable image of the princess, which is comfort and beauty. Yeah, but at the same time, too, when you take a look at uh, the princess in media, they're trying to change that, um, especially with Nintendo's Princess Zelda. Like, I'm not talking about Breath of the Wild here. Like, if you go even further, uh, probably Ocarina of Time... Um, she went out of her way to try and guide Link and save the world of Hyrule as Sheik. Oh, watch out, you'll invoke an Sarkeesian. Oh no, oh no. But still, Princess in Media has been changing slowly, especially if you've seen Drawn Together. Ay. Okay, I, that one, that is definitely not an evolution of the princess. It's actually quite terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's played by Twilight, so, yeah. Uh, but still, but still, um, so, I mentioned before to summarize, Twilight may, de- may create a device where it helps with magic, and she might grow into a better pony, or grow into a better princess, who knows? We shall see. Yep, yep. And well, with that, I think we reach our end out of the main six. You want to take a bonus character? What would Spike do? Going forward, he yeah. can be an ambassador to dragons. He can remain Twilight's ever faithful assistant. I, I think at some point he might let go of his crush of rarity. Well, yeah, you know what? Spike here is a lovable guy. He is the every guy where he's in a group of girls where they don't, they just see him as the little brother. And you know what? That's cool because right now, He's just a baby dragon. When he grows up, probably he'll hook up with Princess Ember. Who knows, right? Well, we don't we don't need to go that far just yet. Yeah, true that. But um, he could be the ambassador to the Dragon Empire, so that's cool. Very. To summarize, 
Spike here has a lot of potential. He's still a young character, like almost to the point of the CMCs, where his potential is limitless. It's just based on what the writers want to do with him. And who knows, he probably might hook up with Rarity. That'll be cool. Maybe. Yay, no. So anyway, that's our thought on the character arc for the main 6 plus Spike. We'll have to wait and see how they go forward with this. But I do believe that the arc for the characters is never over as long as the show remains to be shown. And to be honest, as long as there's interest, um, fic writers will continue doing what they're doing because it's never the end for a character's arc. Or an arc, an arc ends, but characters do not. Yes, that's also true. Uh, if you take a look, see at... Uh, some of the shows that are showing right now, some characters are developing. Um, example, Dragon Ball Super, Krillin is training again, and he's getting stronger. Yay. And Goku is becoming the plague of all existence. I will yep. keep harping on this because I am a mean person. That near bird, you harp on everything. That's right. I need to get a harp sound effect. Uh, unfortunately, I don't, but, you know, I've always got... <laughs> oh no, oh no. So anyway, uh, if you guys at home would like to suggest us um, a topic of discussion, you can do so at uh, patreon.com slash the MBS show where five bucks will give us a topic to discuss. Um, Nandra Gratorius has done so with this topic and I do believe that a few others have done so too. Um, for those, you have to wait and see who we pick. But before I head off, I would like to thank our Patreons who are kind enough to support us. Lurker Cat, Twilight Genesis, Nemdracotorius, uh, Starstream, and also Master of Lag. Thank you so much for the support. So anyway, for next week's show, we'll probably do a comic review. I think that's safe to assume, right, Silva? I think it's very safe to assume, though. What comic review there remains a surprise? Probably the Friends Forever because we want to end that series because what we're on chapter thirty one and there's only seven more chapters to go, right? We're we're making our way, but why be in such a hurry to say goodbye? It's a good series. Yeah. I true, like this series. True. Yeah. True, true. And by the time we're well, in midway of reviewing something, season seven will come out. Uh... Oh, don't, you sound so afraid. Come on, don't you want to see the Pinkie Pie engagement episode? Oh, yeah. You know what? I'm excited for season seven. Let's do this. Oh, yeah. By the way, I did look up the, the name of that stone from the transcripts. It's called the Pairing Stone. Ah, the Pairing Stone. What did I mention before? The Couple Stone? The Pairing the, the Stone? Couple the Couple Stone? The, the Marriage Stone? Either way. <laughs> yeah. But anywho, oh, I have don't been... Get married. Oh, yay! You and who, Manga? I wish. <laughs> uh, but anywho, I have been Norman Sanzo. I am the Silver Krill. I am forever alone, except I'm not. <laughs> and we'll guys, and we'll guys see you for another amazing and fun episode of the MBS show. See ya! Adios! Bye bye! So, whose character arc is the most interesting one? Is it Goku or Vegeta? Uh, I'm going to go with Vegeta because it's, he's the more likable one. I know. Could you believe him? He's so oh, good. The way, has anyone seen Samurai Jack Best? Oh, Samurai Jack is awesome.